Excellent. So welcome everybody and thank you all for coming to this rather experimental workshop that um, Catherine and I are doing on applying the capability approach to open educational practice, to our practice actually. Um, if anyone wants to follow the slides in Google Slides, there's a tiny URL below um, and it's also got links out in the final slide, but we'll show you that um, tiny URL again. Catherine might put it in the in the chat box. So the purpose of oh, <laughs> Catherine has to move because there's a fire alarm in her hotel. Okay. Um, well, while Catherine's doing that, hopefully it's just a drill and not an actual fire. Um, I'll explain the purpose of the session, which is to think about our own practice as open educators and to use the capability approach as a theoretical framework for doing so. So it's kind of self-reflection, but also learning and developing a shared language for talking about it in this particular way. So the first question is to ask those of you who are able to type in the chat um, if you've ever used the capability approach before or if you've come across it for any reason um, can you just add something in the chat if you've never used it before put that in as well because we just would like to know what the starting point is for most of you um, and if you're on your phone on the bus and you can't type in the chat but you're able to speak please feel free to grab the mic if you can. Okay, I'm seeing a couple of comments saying people have not heard of it or used it before, but are interested and eager even to hear more about it. Leo says, everything he knows about it, he's learned from my blog. Oh, goodness, okay. <laughs> um, Antonio heard of it and intuitively adopted without knowing much about it. Oh, how interesting. You might find that applies to more than just Antonio because it's been around in many different forms um, for quite some time. Um, and particularly in the form of human development, which we'll mention briefly. Um, I think if Catherine is, Catherine, okay. Hopefully when Catherine comes back, she will announce herself. Otherwise I'll just continue without her. So yes, and Leo mentions that Helen Beetham drew on the capabilities approach in her GISC digital capabilities framework, which some people may be familiar with. Tiramani says you use this actively because of your work around equity, because opportunity is very excellent, Tiramani. We will be looking for um, some in-depth input from you as we work through this workshop. So in a nutshell, the capability approach is a conceptual framework, and it focuses on the extent to which individuals experience well-being or have opportunities to experience well-being, um, plus the ways in which social arrangements, institutions, and policies in a society influence the well-being of individuals in that um, society. So you'll see there is quite a strong focus on the individual, which seems at first to be a little contradictory because it's called a normative approach. But actually you'll see at the end, when you start comparing the capabilities that different individuals have in a particular social or political setting, um, you can start to see what needs to change, whether it's um, structural or social or cultural, etc. Thank you for those further comments in the text um, chat I see Antonio and Leo definitely overlaps with critical pedagogy the way it's been applied in higher education. So um, the foundations of the capability approach um, go back to Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum who were writing in the 1990s um, about um, Amartya Sen initially as an economist and then Nussbaum coming in with a background in law and philosophy. Um, and Sen was challenging the notion that in order to achieve equality in society, everybody just needed equal access to resources. And I think this was kind of um, the equity debate 
but it wasn't initially phrased so much in equity terms. Much It is much more so now. And I see Catherine Cronin number two is back. <laughs> well done, Catherine. I'm hoping your fire um, alarm is over and there was no drama attached. Uh, so that was Amar Chisen. He was challenging the concept of resources being the be all and end all of equality. And he said people need more than resources, they need opportunities, real opportunities, he called those capabilities, to use those resources in a meaningful way that added value within their own view of the world. So Martha Nussbaum took those ideas, worked with them further, as I said, from the point of view of philosophy. Mahbub al Haq, you may never have heard his name, but he was very influential in the development of the UN's human development indicators and the whole concept of human development, which is at the core of the United Nations, all the work they do on welfare. So that's why I think many of you may have actually come across the capability approach without necessarily knowing it. Um, others who have um, been influential are Ingrid Robaines, who wrote a fantastic CC Open book on it in 2017, link at the end of the slides. Melanie Walker is the main person in higher education and many, many others, um, too many to mention here. But um, if Catherine's back, I will pass on to Catherine. Yes, apologies, everyone. Oh, the drama. Um, apparently, there's a faulty fire alarm. So if it goes off again, I'll just turn off my mic and Gabby will seamlessly pick up um, as she's already done. Thanks, Gabby. <laughs> um, Gabby's already given an introduction. Um, yes, Leo, there's always drama. Um, an introduction into the capability approach and the point is that it considers each person as an end, as Gabby has probably already said, and not looking at total or average well-being, but opportunities available to each person. So we're going to have an opportunity, each person here in the workshop, to build a map yourself. Um, but we just wanted to introduce the key concepts um, that we'll be developing throughout the workshop. Um, and obviously, these include capabilities, but also functionings and conversion factors. So capabilities are what Sen calls substantial freedoms. So if a person has the freedom to choose what they are able to do and to be. So these might include things like to have good health, to have adequate shelter, to have bodily integrity, as Martha Nussbaum identifies, which includes being able to move freely, you know, from place to place. Um, functionings are the realizations of one or more of these capabilities. Um, in an individual's life. And um, these functions, functionings can be, you know, low level or elementary or valued. And we will use the term valued functionings. This is from, from Sen's terminology, which relates specifically to those functionings that are about well-being. Um, and finally, um, there are a concept called conversion factors. Um, some which may enable you to convert resources into capabilities and some which may constrain you from doing so. So that's a lot of terminology, but we're actually going to step through it one by one and you're actually going to build a map which will hopefully facilitate you getting to grips with some of the complexity of a capability approach, but also think about how to apply it with respect to open. Okay, so if you are in a position to do so um, and you want to join along with us and create your own capability map, then um, just grab a piece of paper and some writing tools, ideally at least an A4 size sheet of paper or bigger if you can, um, and you'll see why as we go through it. So. Back to Catherine to introduce the aspirations. Okay, um, so the we're we're going to step through um, in four different steps of kind of building building your map. And the first is the key one, and because that's we're going to ask you to identify an aspiration that you have. Uh, as an open educational practitioner. And aspiration might be the terminology that we would use when we talk about this, but in the terminology of capability approach, this would be called a valued functioning. So it relates to well-being. So we're just going to ask you now, and we can we can use the chat, we can use the voice um, as you kind of think about what your aspiration might be for this exercise. But please think of an aspiration or a goal that you have that will be challenging to achieve 
uh, in relation to open education. And when you're thinking of that, also think about whose well-being it will enhance. Um, it could be yours, it could be someone else's. And because this is the first piece of your map that we're asking you to add, um, we've created a Google Doc. You don't have to use it. You can use the doc, you can use the chat, but we just thought it might be um, useful for us to share our aspirations with one another if you want to um, so that you can really feel happy that you've identified a useful aspiration and then you can write that one on the bottom of your paper and we'll build our maps. But as with every step of the process here, Gabby's going to show an example um, so she can so you can get an idea of the kind of thing we're talking about. So Gabby, do you want to, to show you know what your aspiration uh, is and this yep. is also in the Google Doc? Okay, and I'm seeing quite a few people already in the Google Doc, which is wonderful. Um, so I put mine at the top in that table at the Google Doc. Um, my aspiration is to develop and share my PhD thesis as an open thesis. So primarily here, I'm talking about the open aspects of um, sharing my thesis as I go along. My thesis is on investing student engagement in the case of forced migrants in online higher education. So in terms of whose well-being I hope it will enhance, I hope it will enhance people who are refugees, asylum seekers, other kinds of forced migrants who want mm -hmm. to learn online and probably learners from other underrepresented minority groups. Um, and it will help them indirectly by contributing to our, and when I say our, I mean in the higher education sector, collective understanding of the lived experience of such learners. I will keep quiet for a little bit now because I see lots of stuff happening in that doc. And I, I think um, everyone has the ability to click on their mic if they want to ask a question or make a comment. Um, a, a nice small group here and we can, you know, we can really build dialogue in as we go. Wow, so no shortage of um, aspirations here and ambitious aspirations, I must say. Um, so for anybody who's not able to check the um, Google Doc because perhaps you're on the bus on your phone or something, or you're watching the recording of this, some examples we've got of aspirations are Persuade teaching colleagues to publish OER. Connect educators through virtual exchange to enable them to co-design virtual exchange programs. Complete and share the results of my PhD research into institutional policy. That's quite a long one, so I'll stop there, but great that someone else is linking it to their PhD. Mm -hmm. Um, reflect and improve on practice. I think that could apply to all of us. Um, I'm hoping that's why we're all here today. Raise awareness of OER in my institution. Yep. Contribute to a culture of student creation of OER. Wonderful. And then all the associated um, individuals and groups who are benefiting. I'll move on to the next slide. I know most people have shifted into their, a different tab in their browser probably by now, but if you want to see the next slide, you'll see how I've um, positioned my aspiration and the rationale for whose well-being it will enhance right at the very bottom of my sheet of paper. Now, really, this should be done in a portrait format, not a landscape format. We're a bit um, constrained by the format of the slide presentation. So if you can use your sheet of paper and just transfer your aspiration and well-being, just use bullet points, you don't have to write it out in full, to the bottom of your piece of paper in a box or a cloud or a bubble or whatever works best for you and we're going to work upwards from there so um, do you think we can we're ready to move on Catherine does anyone want yeah. to ask anything 
Yeah, if anybody wants to ask a question in the chat or on the mic, comment. And if not, we can just we can just go ahead. But you know, we're, we just want to be clear that we're open at any point to pause, to you know, explore things further. I see Karina has put her hand up. So Karina, do you have the power yes. to grab the mic? Nice to hear your voice. Nice to be here. <laughs> Um, yeah, can you hear me well? Yes. Yes. Good. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I arrived a few minutes late, so it could be that you have covered this um, already. But what if my aspiration is more practical and not necessarily related to enhance and uh, well-being of the learners, for example. Okay, what? that's fine. It might be enhancing your own well-being by mm -hmm. making your life simpler, saving you time, or making things smoother between you and your colleagues. It doesn't have to be a huge world-changing enhancement goal. Um, right. Yeah, and I guess by working on my aspirations, that really has a fulfilling effect anyway, personally, exactly. professionally. And yes, and once you've achieved that aspiration, it's a constant upward chain of aiming for new aspirations. Mm -hmm. So it should prepare the groundwork for further valued functionings, as we call them in the capability approach. Yeah. So this might just be a milestone along Wonderful. the way. Great. Glad you. you asked that, Karina, because there is this, you know, there is a, a whole set of terminology in the capability approach, and valued functioning is is one of mm. them. It's, uh, you mm. know, it's the realization of capabilities, but by it, a valued functioning means it relates specifically to well-being, you know, as as yeah. I said, either for you or someone else. And it's it's good that yeah. you know it doesn't have, even though the name the the. the it feels like uh, uh, what's your aspiration so it doesn't have to be there can be my individual a small one that slowly mm. one builds on the other it doesn't have to be anything uh, um you know to change the world to begin with <laughs> thank no, you because lots yeah. of small aspirations you know combined <laughs> can change the world um, I mean, as Catherine points out, the valued functioning means it must be something important to you. Mm -hmm. um, so Very something that you see as meaningful. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank yeah. you. Great. OK. Uh, let's see. So I think people, mm -hmm. one or two people are still writing in the doc, but um, I'm assuming that by now most people have gone on to writing on their own chart by hand. So shall I move on to the next slide? Back to you, Catherine. Sure. Yeah, and, and obviously people can um, tell us to slow down or, or pause if we yeah. want to. Um, so we're, we're going through four distinct uh, steps in kind of building our maps today. And the second one is, you know, once you've identified this value functioning, this aspiration that you'd like to achieve, um, next step is thinking about what resources do you need in order to achieve this? And you know, it doesn't have to be an exhaustive list of resources. And usually, this is not difficult for any of us because we, <laughs> we can identify the resources that we have or the resources that we want to have. So, what are the what are the resources that you believe you need in order to achieve that aspiration? They could be things like having time, having uh, permission, having access to something, um, a tool. Um, so it can be a, a whole range of things, but just brainstorm and, and think about what resources you need to achieve the aspiration you identified. And again, Gabby, I'll just share an example. Right. OK, so in my case, the only resources I've put there, but I am sure I need others as well. But really, the most essential resources for me to do an open thesis um, are my social networks. Um, because otherwise it's not open at all. So I need the networks, I need the platforms, and then I need all the tech setup, the Wi-Fi, you know, laptop devices. Um, and beyond that, I need resources to do the PhD itself. I need access to libraries, I need access to databases, journal articles, um, I need 
time probably is the most fundamental one. Um, so we're just asking you to add this um, to your own um, map that you're drawing. And I'm seeing some interesting comments in the chat there <laughs> about how the process breaks things down and Antonio finding this therapeutic. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone want to ask anything at this stage or um, say anything else or shall we move on to the next stage? The, the really interesting stage is coming next. <laughs> okay, we didn't think anything badly of you at all, Antonio, or anything like that. Um, glad you okay. will. So, um, we are perhaps used to thinking in terms of, you know, if I want to do X, then I need to have Y, right? And so in other words, in terms of thinking of resources that we need, but thinking about abilities is a different type of thinking. So in order to achieve your aspiration, what do you need to, what do you need to be able to do or to be to achieve your aspiration? This is the notion of capabilities. So capabilities could be things like opportunities, uh, you know, what you're able to do or be, or also, you know, more just things like skills um, and capacities that can be fostered um, under particular circumstances. So again, feel free to, um, to ask questions in the chat or, you know, look back at, um, you know, what you wrote for your aspiration, but thinking at root, what do you need to be able to do or what do you need to be able to be in order to achieve your aspiration? And Gabby is going to share her example just to maybe help you along. Okay, thanks, Catherine. Um, I, so the thing about capabilities is it's often defined in different ways by different people and that makes the reading very confusing sometimes. So initially, um, oh, that's, Catherine's fire alarm going off again. Oh dear. <laughs> Initially, um, Amartya Sen defined capabilities as specifically opportunities and freedoms to do things. And then Martha Nussbaum took that idea and, and completely agreed with that, but said we need to define those opportunities and freedoms in a list. She made a list of 10 core um, core capabilities which you can find on wikipedia it's fascinating if you want to capability approach wikipedia and you look for that list of 10 and those are like the essential what she called fundamental entitlements of all human beings melanie walker who uh, took this into higher education and many many other authors since then um, expanded the notion of capabilities to also include the more commonly associated way of thinking of capabilities are skills and capacities that can be fostered. So it's quite useful when you talk about the capabilities that you have or that you need to specify whether you're talking about them in terms of opportunities or skills and capacities. And sometimes, as I think is gonna, you're going to see in my case, it's a bit hard to separate them. So when you put your capabilities on your flowchart, it's going to become a flowchart flowing upwards. Um, leave a gap, please, between resources and capabilities. And um, we're going to add some an essential element there in the next slide. But for me, the capabilities that I need to do an open thesis are the opportunity and the freedom to disseminate my processes, my reflections, and my findings as I go along, and the opportunity to interact with, in with my intended audience. I also need a whole bunch of skills and sort of personal capacities, cognitive capacities. I need to be able to read loads and loads of stuff, understand it, um, make sense of it, you know, remix it in such a way in my writing that it makes sense to others and that it generates new knowledge. So I haven't put those in there because it would just have been too much text on my model map. Um, I'm seeing Leo put in the chat box, this point about opportunities is really useful. Uh, thanks, Leo. Yeah, it, 
it is con I still get confused I've been reading this stuff for more than a year as you'll see from my blog and um, developing and changing my understanding of it all the time but really it is helpful to understand that initial sort of basic foundation of capabilities as it's opportunities and freedoms almost in the sense of human rights but going one step beyond human rights when Martha Nussbaum talks about fundamental entitlements because we often have human rights that can't actually be acted on so in many countries it's a right for all children to go to school but their families need the girls to stay home and look after their younger siblings for example so they have the right to be educated but they don't have the capability to be educated so that's the essential point there um i think i'll stop teaching kathy it sounds like opportunities has a lot yeah do you want to take over there catherine is your fire alarm Drama. Yes, I think oh, for the moment. Um, yes, indeed, Kathy, and um, it does have a lot to do with process and, and relationships. And Martha Nussbaum and others make the really valuable point that you know we can't really convert capabilities to, into functionings unless the context you know permits that, and that's everything: the social context, personal context, institutional context, and so on. Um, and I know I, I had to flee at the you know, when we were doing introductions, but, you know, perhaps this is a good place to mention that, you know, this is in, in my blog post related to this workshop. This is the reason why I advocated using the notion of abilities in our work on open education at the National Forum in Ireland. So we were using the UNESCO recommendations in OER, which talk about building capacities, um, but depth of, of really understanding well-being um, and the focus on the individual is included in the capability approach or the capabilities approach. So we kind of extended that UNESCO recommendation and talked about developing open capabilities um, in the higher education sector. So I suppose that's my example. That's really interesting, this um, discussion about the relationships, because that, for me, that's all my that my capabilities are about and in the work I'm doing with um, refugees as online learners their social engagement is only one of four types of engagement I'm looking at I'm also looking at cognitive um, behavioral and emotional engagement but the social engagement does turn out to be pretty fundamental as well so hopefully everyone's had a chance now to um, think of a couple of capabilities that you need to achieve your aspiration um, doesn't have to be a full comprehensive list just a couple um, we'll move on Catherine and this is you'll be you may be you know pleased or dismayed to know that this is the last step <laughs> of, the, of building the maps and then we'll really talk about how the, the different um, pieces uh, relate to one another. But step four is thinking about, um, in English we would say enablers and constraints and in the language of the capability approach we talk about positive conversion factors and negative conversion factors. And the reason they're called that is because they're the factors that either enable you to convert your resources into capabilities or constrain you from converting your resources into capabilities. Um, so um, on our map, we're calling them enablers and constraints, but we have the full um, the full terminology there. And again, I think as with all of these, it's useful to see an example. So Gabby's going to show her map again. Okay, now this is, for me, this is kind of the heart of where the capability approach becomes helpful kind of practically useful and you'll find in a, a lot of the literature that's used capabilities in higher education they focus in on conversion factors so we've just called them enablers and constraints here for ease of you know <laughs> ease of terminology but as um, if you think of them as the factors as Catherine said that convert your resources into the capabilities or the opportunities that you need to achieve your valued functioning your aspiration um, this is where things either go and things go one way or the other 
um, depending on whether the enablers can sort of outwin <laughs> over the constraints or if you've got overwhelming constraints, um, then you might find that no matter how many enablers you've got, um, you just, you don't really stand a chance of achieving that valued functioning. Now there is the, uh, there is another element that I'm going to show you in the next slide. So it doesn't just boil down to these. It would be very simple if it did, <laughs> but it's not that simple. Simple. Anyway, I'll explain. The enablers in my case are, so they're divided into environmental, social, and personal. And these come, these terms come from Sen and have been reused throughout the literature. And I think they're fairly self-explanatory. The example that Sen gave and has been used over and over again in the literature is a bicycle. A bicycle is a wonderful resource. And you might have a bicycle and want to use your bicycle to go to work. So your valued functioning is go to work and you've got a job and you've got a bicycle. So in theory, you should be able to go to work on your bicycle, right? Um, and but then your conversion factors are going to influence whether you can actually do that. So environmentally, you need good roads, you need a good infrastructure where you know you can actually physically ride a bike um, safely. Um, I'll skip to personal next. You need the, the ability, you know, the skill to ride a bike without falling off it, um, unlike me. <laughs> That's a non-starter for me, sadly. Um, but socially, the social one becomes really important here because in some societies, it's a taboo for women to ride bikes. So you've got the bike, you've got the job, you've got good roads, you know how to ride a bike because you learned when you're a little kid, but you don't have the capability to go to work on your bike because you're a woman and your society doesn't allow women to ride bikes. So that's kind of the sort of archetypal um, example that's always given. So in my case, environmentally, I could say that's always about infrastructure and sort of wider context and so on. So in my case, an enabler is I have access to online tools and spaces for creating and sharing my work. Um, socially, I have wonderful social networks. I'm right in the middle of one of them right now, so I'm in my element. And personally, um, I have a lot of enthusiasm for doing open access research, and that kind of drives me along. The constraints, on the other hand, are can sometimes be daunting. Institutional rules about what a PhD thesis should be prevented me, for example, from doing a huge collaborative thesis, you know, getting massive participation from every refugee and asylum seeker I could find, um, you know, and writing it as a big Google Doc, um, because it has to be <laughs> authored by me, okay. Um, and perhaps I was a bit conservative and I didn't push the boundaries there, I could have kind of wish I had now, but anyway, <laughs> it's too late for that now. Um, Again, I'll jump to personal next because for me, a, con a huge constraint personally is my limited time because I work part time and I do other things. Um, but the interesting one for me again is social, that um, it's a constraint, but it's a really important constraint. Um, I would love to just do everything absolutely openly to be, you know, having my interviews online with the people I'm speaking to live on YouTube, like we're doing this today kind of thing. But for very, very obvious ethical reasons, that's just not um, not feasible and not wise. So I'm constantly having to make small judgments. And I think that I, this goes back to that um, paper that you wrote, Catherine, about how we as open education practitioners are constantly making small decisions from the micro right through to the, the meso and the macro. You know, do it, should I share this? What should I share? How should I share it? Who should I share it with? Etc. Um, and that becomes quite an important part of the process. So it feels like a constraint, but actually it's kind of part of the overall aim as well, if that makes any sense. I'll stop there, Catherine. 
Yeah, I'll add one small thing. That was a beautiful description, Gabby, and, and really want to open the mic and the chat to everyone who's thinking through this. But, you know, so many of us engaged in critical and social justice approaches to open education, you know, and in, in talking, you know, pointing people to, to, uh, to look at the structures, you know, look at the structural impediments, don't just look at individuals. And I think a really powerful aspect of the capability approach is that it's very holistic. So you look at all the enablers, as Gabby has shown, from the very personal to the cultural and to the structural, um, and likewise look at the constraints in that way as well. So it frees up a lot of the discussion and the this is a different lens um, for looking yeah. at the problem. Yeah, actually, that's a good point, Catherine. We haven't got the word structural on the diagram. And I, I was kind of looking for it, thinking, hmm, where is it? But actually, it's definitely environmental because it's what's in the infrastructure that has been set up through, you know, mm -hmm. various political and social processes. It's in the social. It's even in the personal because, um, you know, that that's the whole equity thing again, where a person who has a uh, let's say disability or something um therefore doesn't have the opportunity the capability to do what they want to do they are prevented by structural elements so it's kind of running all the way through this and i see we're getting some comments about bourdieu in the <laughs> in the chat some people have um linked uh their capabilities work to um to Bourdieu, Caroline Sargini Hart, I think her name is, wrote a book in 2012, um, which I'll share the link to a bit later on um, if anyone's interested, um, where she used Bourdieu's concepts of cultural capital and you know students coming to university lacking certain capitals. Um, and it actually works very well together with the capability approach. So the capability approach has been critiqued by some people for being too individually focused and not giving enough of a sort of structural critique of society. Um, and for that reason, some people have combined it with other approaches. But I'll move on just to sort of keep us moving through the, the map now and you'll see in the next version of the flowchart, um, we've added arrows. And Catherine and I had a really interesting beginning of a conversation just before this session started where I thought, oh my God, I've got to revise the map. Catherine said, as an engineer, she is she has issues with some of these arrows that only go one way. And as soon as she said that, I thought, yeah, because aspiration, I've got it leading up to resources. But actually, even in the original, all the literature by Amartya Sen and all the early writers, they were talking about how your aspirations can be severely constrained by the availability of resources or in, you know, or expanded depending on what resources you know are available. So, um, they use a term for that which they call um what's the term they use adaptive preference um where people kind of adapt their vision of what they're able to do and what they want and what they like according to what they think is doable so yeah the arrows are probably much too simplistic going only in one direction um anyway be that as it may i've added in personal agency and I can, uh, I can imagine there's lots and lots to say about that. Um, perhaps just at this stage to say that Sen talked about two kinds of agency. He talked about agency freedom and agency achievement. So it's a, very similar to the concept of capabilities, the, the concept of freedom to do something, but do you actually achieve your agency um, by acting on it. Uh, so it's a sort of subtle distinction and we can go into that a bit more if anybody's interested. But um, open the mic, Gabby, because I'd love to hear. I know we only have about, you know, just under 10 minutes left. Um, really interested in people's thoughts or reactions or want to share anything about what's emerged in their own maps. Can I just check, Catherine, what time are we actually ending? Is it 11 or is it 10 past 11? It's supposed to be an hour session. So if you want to go oh, into great. 10 past, okay. you're free to. <laughs> OK, uh, thank you.
I mean, we can certainly end a few minutes early. No one complains at that, but I, I definitely would love to yeah. hear. There's a great bit of chat going on, but I know not everyone may have access to the chat. So um, anyone who wants to, to jump in, by all means, please do so. <laughs> Kathy is constrained by resources, so she'll look at the documents. <laughs> Um, here, Teresa, we understand. <laughs> Antonio, anyone want to add anything here? It would also be interesting just to hear what you're seeing as your own enablers and constraints. If you want to share um, any of that. Antonio. Well, yes, yes. No, I'm just thinking that um, sometimes when I think about my enablers and my constraints, I have to think, unfortunately, about a lot of people who have enables and constraints and, and they are working on on them and it's it's not that i cannot talk to somebody uh, with more power than me about my constraints and our enablers is that there are a lot of people doing the same with their own little agendas and objectives which are as legitimate as mine so um yeah one social constraint there is, is, that, is that we operate in a constant state of competition, you know? I compete with other colleagues, for instance, in attracting the student time to my module. I want them to do very well in my module. In, even if I, if I respect and love my colleagues, eventually I'm drawing my students to my subject and getting them to work harder for mine, and that's a detriment or a constraint for others. Is this? you know, interrelationship that comes uh, from uh, from that state of competition that we seem to be living inevitably. Okay. Sorry that's, to be so. <laughs> no, no, that's really interesting because, um, you know, Sen talks about capability sets and Ingrid Robains gives a, a great explanation of how if you, um, if you put your efforts into achieving one set of capabilities, you may you may have to do that at the expense of another set of capabilities. And I think the example she gives of someone who chooses whether to go to work or do further education or try and combine them um, and maybe have a family as well. You know, so you're constantly having to weigh up as an individual. Now you're applying this concept to a kind of collective decision making, where ideally, if you're working in a team, then you collectively decide on things like, I don't know, I'm just randomly thinking the assessment when when which module is going to make the greatest demands on that same cohort of students so that they don't have all the same de all demands coming from all angles at the same time. Yeah. 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 yeah so correct. where I've got personal agency on the map, I nearly added in personal and collective agency because I love the mm. idea of collective agency and there's quite a lot in the literature about that too. So mm -hmm. perhaps that's where your comment belongs is in the concept of collective agency. Yeah, and uh, and how people can articulate that desires and their um, and their aspirations in uh, in a situation where everybody's supposed to have aspirations and pursue them and this is where institutional norms come about that in a way they can be a constraint but they are also opportunity that they limit you know the way in which we compete for our goals exactly mm -hmm. they channeled them in a way yeah that's really interesting um thanks for those comments also leo and liz about um the process being helping you to reflect on your own experience liberating and productive that's nice <laughs> So I wonder, Catherine, shall we? Oh, we're right at the end, but there's, um, yes. yeah, maybe that. Oh, and I, was, I, I do appreciate the feedback. Gabby and I have been, we were, this is based on Gabby's PhD research. I want to be really clear. And, you know, I have been reading about the capabilities approach, not to the extent that Gabby has, but we've had discussions all along because I've approached it more from a practice point of view about how I could use it in my practice. And it's been really, really 
useful and I've learned a lot, but you know, Gabby is much more immersed in the literature and I so value that. But in, in designing the workshop, you know, we made a decision early on that we would do it on paper, that we wouldn't have people filling in boxes on the screen. So I'm really glad to hear that, um, that th there's been a positive response to that. Because if we do this again, I think it's nice just to, um, as you said, Liz, just listen to discussion and kind of, you know, uh, draw away or write away or take your own notes. Because uh, it is deep thinking, it is complex. We can't deny the complexity of the capability approach, but it's really generative as well um, in terms of what it enables, in terms of looking at problems and, and developing um, kind of successive solutions to problems to improve well being. So, yeah, I mean, the, the link that we, we yeah, yeah is, uh, is to all of the resources that we've been mentioning. Thank you, Michelle. Glad to hear. Um, Catherine, I'll add your blog post. And honestly, that's you know, I, I don't think there's any in a very very full day. I don't think there's any crime in finishing a few minutes early, because <laughs> it's a it's an awfully full day. But I don't. I also want to be sure that we answer people's questions or or have give you an opportunity to to talk. Catherine, that's completely fine. If you're happy and you don't feel like anyone has any further questions, we can end the recording in the session now. Or I'm happy we can to give a few more moments. Stay here, Gab, and we can we can have further chat if people want to. Is that okay with you? Yes, yes, of course. Okay. Um, I'll just put the that's the tiny URL back to the um, slides again in case you want the links direct from there. Karina's got her hand up. Karina. Thank you. Well, thanks for for the the, the presentation. The workshop it has been really really interesting, and I can see, like others here, is uh, are putting in the chat how this can be applied to my own work as you know, helping others, helping other academics in professional academic professional development to actually think about their aspirations and well-being and how you know their work can affect the work of others and how my work can also uh, help them uh, to have this reflection because like other said it's very uh, uh, um, it's a very a very good framework to use and you know it's in in small stages so it doesn't overwhelm uh, um, users and and I found it very interesting so thank you ladies for your work and presentation That's great. thank you for the feedback I Thank see you, some people Karina. disappearing. Yeah, yeah. But anyone who wants to stay on for a bit, and have, anyone has, and we will, and we will, we will pop over to Discord. Um, oh yes, just kind of meandering, you know, as things occur to you, conversations. I really enjoyed that in Discord yesterday. So um, we will definitely do that today. Yeah. And there's some wonderful sessions coming up next, including Lorna's. So we want to do that too. Great. Gabby, Catherine, if you're you happy, so we'll end the recording now. Yes. Okay.